Hi, and welcome back to another day of Universal Algebra and Lattice Theory. Um, I do have my annotation recording issue that I had last time fixed, except now it's a little weird because in order to look at myself talking, I have to look at the other screen, which is over here. So um, hopefully that won't be too annoying. And so today is all about examples of algebras. So uh, again, hopefully the setup will be pretty comfortable because although I may be looking off to the side most of the time, you will be not usually looking at my face. Okay. Oop. All right. So as I said, we're looking at examples of algebras. Last time I had given definitions of operations, algebras, and other related concepts, as well as some general context for uh, the study of these things. Oops. Okay, here we go. So today I'm gonna cover a lot of different things, but uh, as you might imagine, each of them will go pretty quick because there are a lot of them. So uh, first I'm going to do a quick review of the definition of an algebra as it appears in the study of universal algebra. Then I will uh, talk about magmas, semi-groups, monoids, groups, rings, modules, quasi-groups, semi-lattices, lattices, and finally n-ary magmas. So that's a lot to do in an hour, but it actually will be pretty doable. Okay, so first of all, remember that operations are rules for combining elements of a set together to get another element from that same set. So formally, if I have some set A and some whole number n, which remember is allowed to be zero, then we refer to a function f taking a to the n to a as an n-ary operation on the set A. When f is an n-ary operation on A, we also say that f has arity n. And those mean the same thing, being n-ary or having arity n. Algebras are sets which come along with an indexed sequence of operations, the basic operations of the algebra. So our formal definition is that an algebra is this ordered pair, A, F, where A is, is set, the universe of the algebra, and perhaps the universe in universal algebra, and, uh, and F is a sequence indexed by some set I of operations on A. Okay, so we talked about that last time. And now let's see some examples of these things. Well, an algebra, which remember I'll write bold A to indicate the pair A and its basic operations. And if I'm writing by hand, I'm usually going to write this as A with a line underneath it. And that's my bold A when I'm writing by hand. Uh, some, some print sources will also actually just put the line underneath the A too. So an algebra A with a single binary operation for its basic is its only basic operation is called a magma. So a magma is just a set with a single binary operation defined on it. This is the Bourbaki terminology. Uh, these algebras are also known as groupoids and binars. Uh, the term groupoid has actually since become attached to a different concept in category theory. And so uh, I believe <laughs> it's a very contentious issue what you call these things. Um, I'm going to stick with the Verbaki terminology and also do my best to abstain from any conflict about what these things are called because this dispute arose before I was born. <laughs> okay, so um, when the set A is finite, we can represent the basic operation F taking A squared to A as a finite table called the Cayley table or operation table for the operation F. So here we see a Cayley table for a binary operation, F. And so the operation name or symbol is here in the top left corner. 
And then uh, this table can be read in the following way. So this defines an operation F from A squared to A, where A is the set rock, paper, and scissors, RPS. And so R would be rock, paper would be paper, and scissors represents, S represents scissors. And, uh, and so we interpret this side of the table as being our left input. And this side, this uh, part of the table is being our right input. And then this large part of our table is the output. So if I wanted to use this table to compute, for example, F of rock paper, well, this particular operation is actually defined so that if I, if I multiply two elements according to this rule F, it's picking which of the two objects would be the winner in a game of rock, paper, scissors. And um, as you may recall, rock, paper, scissors is a game where people, uh, two people simultaneously choose either rock, paper, or scissors. And then um, as the saying goes, uh, paper beats rock, um, scissors beat paper, and rock beats scissors. And so if we want to compute F of rock, paper, we look at our left input, which is rock, and then we go over to the paper column for our right input, and we see that, and we see that in that spot, there is a paper. And so paper is the output, and as I said before, the rules for rock, paper, scissors say that paper beats rock, and so that makes sense, given that I said that's how this function was to be defined. So this magma, A, whose universe is that set A containing rock, paper, and scissors, and whose basic operation is this operation F given by this Cayley table, this magma is the rock, paper, scissors magma because it basically tells you the rules of rock, paper, scissors. Okay. So we usually use infix notation for binary operations. So instead of writing f of x, y, like we usually do for functions, we'll write x dot y, for example. So now instead of calling this operation f, we're calling it dot, and we're writing x dot y instead of f of x, y. So any other symbol, like plus, um, an asterisk, or a circle, will work as well, but some have special connotations. So for example, the uh, plus sign usually refers to a commutative operation. And if you use it for a non-commutative one, people might accidentally get confused. Okay. Oh, and it's called an infix because it's inside of the two symbols that it's combining. That's why it's infix notation. Going even further, we often use concatenation notation when there is only a single operation under consideration. So we might write that A is the algebra whose universe is A and whose basic operation is F, or we might write A is A dot to define the rock, paper, scissors magma, but then we might just write R times P equals P rather than F of RP equals P or R dot P equals P. And so, uh, because we know that there's only one operation involved, it doesn't really make it confusing, especially when that one operation is binary, it doesn't really make it confusing to just put uh, symbols right next to each other like this to multiply them. Okay, so uh, naturally concatenation notation is my favorite since it contains a version of my name. My name is Charlotte Aiton, and we can see here that there is a C Aiton in the word concatenation. And so this is, of course, my favorite one. All right. So uh, when the universe A of a magma is infinite, or even just very large, it's easier to specify the basic operation F by way of some rule rather than actually writing out its whole Cayley table. So for example, if we take A to be the set of two by two matrices over the field with 27 elements, um, 
then we can define an operation f taking a squared to a, where f of alpha beta is alpha beta minus beta alpha. So here, alpha beta is going to be um, the usual matrix product of alpha and beta. So I'm using concatenation here to refer to just the usual matrix product of two matrices, and similarly for beta alpha. And then I'm taking that difference, and I'm saying that that difference between alpha beta and beta alpha is f of alpha beta. So that is a perfectly well-defined operation. It's actually um, the commutator uh, for that particular matrix ring. Um, and so, uh, so I could write down the Cayley table for this because this operation has a finite Cayley table. There are only finitely many two by two matrices whose elements come from the field of 27 elements. And so um, I could in principle write out the Cayley table, but writing it out would take a lot of space. And so uh, it's often better to use some kind of rule or formula like this to define your operation. And so the algebra AF is indeed a magma, it's a set along with a specified binary operation on it. So if we want an infinite example of a magma, we can take the natural numbers under addition, where addition is defined in the usual way for natural numbers. Um, and so, of course, it's easy to start writing out maybe the beginning of the Cayley table for this magma but one could never finish because there are infinitely many different natural numbers to add together. All right, now let's move on to a different sort of algebra, a semigroup. Semigroups actually are magmas, but they're special magmas, which satisfy the associative law that x times y times z is the same thing as x times y times z, where we first multiply together y and z over here, and then combine that with x, whereas on the other side, we first multiply x and y, and then finally take the result of that and multiply with z. So a semi-group is nothing but an associative magma. We'll write um, blackboard z to indicate the set of the integers as usual, and we have that the naturals under addition, the whole numbers, which remember are the naturals and also zero, uh, the whole numbers under addition and the integers under addition, these are all semi-groups. They all are sets equipped with an associative binary operation. Also, the naturals under addition is a subalgebra of the whole numbers under addition and the whole numbers under addition is a subalgebra of the integers under addition. We'll talk more about subalgebras next time. So, uh, oh, no, also <laughs> that the natural numbers under multiplication is, is a semi-group, but it's not a subalgebra of the whole numbers under addition. And so uh, to see this, for example, note that uh, three times three is nine, but three plus three is six and six and nine are not the same natural number. And so this cannot be a subalgebra of this because its operation is not simply obtained by restricting the operation on the uh, latter algebra here. Now let's move on to monoids. Monoids are algebras with two basic operations so that if I take my universe M and the first of these basic operations, I get a semi-group. And then I also have a null area or constant operation E, which maps M to the zero to M. And I also need that a monoid satisfies this property where if I take X times E and I always just get X back, and if I take E times X, I always just get X back. In other words, E acts as an identity for uh, this operation dot. Now, if you're being very careful or pedantic, 
then you might notice that e is actually a function from m to the zero to m. And remember that m to the zero can be thought of as a set containing a single empty tuple. And so rather than e, really um, what I might want to say is that the image of the empty tuple under e, um, that this thing is actually an element of my universe m. But because there's only one possible value that we could plug into this nullary operation E, I'm often going to just write E when I really mean the element of M, which is the image of the empty tuple under E. So if that all seemed kind of mysterious to you, but you're comfortable with the concept of an identity element from introductory algebra courses, then don't worry too much about this. But if you are careful with the set theory and the notation, then you'll see that this is actually a, a reasonable simplification. And that um, if we're being very technical, we might write this, but usually that's not necessary. Okay. So in any case, we have that the whole numbers under addition and with zero as our identity element, that these form a monoid. And also the naturals under multiplication with one as the identity element, um, that those are also uh, a monoid. And again, the same comment holds, a null area operation is technically a function, but I'm always going to just identify that function with its image in the universe of the algebra. Okay, so an important example of a monoid is the full transformation monoid. So if I take any set A, I can form a monoid whose universe is A to the A, or the set of all functions from A to itself. And then the binary operation on the set is going to be function composition, indicated by the circle as usual. So then the, con the constant operation is, with square quotes because of that discussion that I just had about the operation not literally being the same as the element of the universe that it corresponds to. But in any case, the constant operation here is the identity map from A to itself, where identity of the set A applied to any element A just gives me back that same little A again. And so uh, this is a very natural example of a monoid. And uh, it's often one that people consider when they study monoids. Okay. So hold on a minute. This wasn't this wasn't in the this wasn't in the agenda, but I realize at this point that there might be a question, which is a totally reasonable question. What is the deal with that squiggly equal sign? What is this thing? Is something being approximated? What's going on there? And so if you don't remember, that squiggly equal sign appeared here and here. And also I used that same squiggly equal sign when I wrote down the associative law. And so this is uh, probably new notation for you if you haven't done uh, universal algebra before. And so here's the situation. First of all, <laughs> First of all, no, this squiggly equal sign does not mean that something is being approximated or there's no asymptotic anything happening here. This is not the meaning that it has in analysis. So no, something is not being approximated. Uh, what's going on is that an expression like x, y, z equals x, y, z stands for an identity, which is shorthand for the statement that for all possible values of x, y, and z, we have that x times y times z this way is equal to x, y, z this way. And so, uh, so this statement about whether these things are equal for all possible choices of x, y, and z, um, this statement is true in some magmas, the semi-groups, that's the definition, is that they're the ones in which the statement is true, um, but it's, it's false in other ones. Like in the rock, paper, scissors magma, um, it's not the case that um, x times y times z equals x y times z for all um, for all x y and z. Um, and now, let me actually do this off the top of my head. If I do rock times paper times scissors, 
then that's going to give me, well, paper and scissors. Scissors cuts paper, so this is rock scissors. The rock smashes the scissors, I suppose. And so rock is victorious here. But if I do rock times paper times scissors, then the paper covers the rock, which defeats it somehow. Um, so I get paper, scissors, and then uh, paper and scissors. The scissors cut the paper, and so scissors wins. And as we can see, rock and scissors are not the same. So in the rock, paper, scissors magma, this identity is, does not hold. It's not this statement that that identity stands for is not true in the rock, paper, scissors magma. OK, so we won't get too technical about what identities are for now, but they will become very important to us later. And so um, just know that it's something to look out for, but it's not going to affect us too much for now if you just write an equal sign, and uh, we won't dwell on it too much. All right. So let's also now take uh, a small aside before getting back to the examples. Uh, let's take an aside to talk about signatures. So uh, previously, we gave a strict definition for the notation where we had an underlying set A and then some finite sequence of basic operations. We said that this was shorthand for an algebra with some underlying set A or some universe A and the sequence of operations big F where uh, our index set I was the finite set one, two, up through K or some natural number K. The signature of such an algebra is the function rho taking each I in the set, each little I in the set big I to the whole number, which is the arity of the corresponding basic operation. And so uh, a function from this set, one, two, up through k, to w, or the whole numbers, is a k-tuple of whole numbers. And so we can just say that the signature of this, of this algebra with just a finite sequence of basic operations is the tuple row of one, row of two, up through row of k. It's just the ordered list of the arities of those basic operations. And so we'll often introduce algebras by saying things like, consider an algebra A with universe A, the set A, and uh, this list of basic operation symbols, f, g, star, plus u, and one, of signature, and then we'll list off the arities of each of these operations. So for example, F has arity 25. It takes 25 different arguments at once. Um, star has two arguments, which it takes. U is a unary operation, and one is actually a null area or constant operation. And so we'll often use this language. Okay, so now back to the examples. A group is an algebra with an underlying set G and then uh, basic operations dot and then this minus one operation and E so that uh, if I take the algebra G dot E, that's actually a monoid. And so in particular, this dot operation is a binary operation and E is that identity from that monoid. And this minus one operation is a unary one so that uh, the algebra G satisfies this statement. Now, this isn't an identity exactly like the ones we've seen before, but you may be able to guess what it means when I chain two of these, two of these uh, squiggly equals statements together. And so what I want is that if I take any x in my group G, then if I take x and uh, multiply it according to dot by its image under this unary operation, this minus one or inversion operation, then x, x inverse is the same thing as x inverse x, which is just E, the identity from that monoid. And so this should be quite familiar if you've seen group theory. Um, and so the main thing to note here is that in universal algebra, the canonical way to formulate what a group is actually 
involves the use of three basic operations of Arides 2, 1, and 0, and a collection of identities. So this is probably a little different than the way that you've seen a group defined uh, previously, but it will turn out to be very useful to think this way later. So for specific examples of groups, we have that the integers with addition, and then this minus stands for uh, taking the multiplicative or taking the additive inverse, multiplying by minus one. So the integers with addition, taking the additive inverse and zero, we have that this is a group. It's the, when people say the group of the integers, this is what they're referring to. Uh, so according to the definition here, if I just have the integers with addition, that's actually neither a group nor a monoid because it doesn't have the right signature. So this is kind of a subtle point um, that we distinguish between Z with addition, inversion, and zero, and just the construct, the algebra that we have where we have just the integers and addition and no other basic operations. So, uh, so this, this algebra, whose universe is Z and whose basic operation is addition, this is a semi-group and hence a special kind of magma, but according to our definition, it's actually not a monoid or a group. So that's something to be careful about because that's, that's a bit of a technicality. We usually don't really think of these as being two different things, but it will help us to be a little bit careful and notice that they aren't, strictly speaking, the same algebraic structure. Okay, so now an important example of a group, that the integers are quite an important example too, um, is the permutation group, uh, which we'll denote by uh, perm A, so whose universe, uh, perm A without the bold, consists of the set of all bijections from a given set A to itself, whose binary operation, circle, is function composition, whose unary operation, is given by taking the inverse function and whose null area operation is the identity map on A. And again, the, the is is in square quotes because of the discussion I had before, where if you're being careful, technically the constant operation is not the same as the element, which is its image in the universe of your algebra, but usually we don't distinguish between those two things. And no, one, no one's gonna yell at us, so it's okay. All right, now let's move on to another object, which you have probably seen in previous algebra courses. A ring is an algebra uh, consisting of an algebra with some underlying, some universe R uh, and uh, two basic binary operations, addition and multiplication, a basic unary operation, inversion, and a constant operation zero, so that if I look at if I look at R with just addition, inversion, and zero, I get an abelian group. That's a group whose binary operation is commutative. And if I look at R with just the basic operation dot, I get a semi-group, an associative magma. And also I need that the identities X times or dot y plus z is the same thing as xy plus xz, and y plus zx is the same as yx plus zx. In other words, I need the distributive laws to hold, which relate the structure of the abelian group to the structure of the semi-group. Okay, and so, uh, so I suppose I will write these are the uh, distributive laws or identities. And so for an example, the algebra Z with its usual addition, multiplication, uh, negation, and zero um, is a ring. And so uh, a point we haven't stressed too much until now is that the order of the basic operations matters. So if I look at the algebra Z multiply add negate zero, that's not the same algebra as Z add multiply negate zero. 
And so this thing where I swapped addition and multiplication, that's not even a ring according to our definition, even though both of these algebras have the same signature, which is 2210. So that's something to be careful of because uh, it can become very confusing later on actually when you have more unusual sorts of algebras that you're looking at. You can't swap two of the operations even if they appear very similar to each other. That's not going to uh, necessarily give you the same sort of algebra anymore. So, um, I mean, certainly they're different objects, but they don't even have to satisfy the same identities. And so that's something that can appear very subtle in a particular situation, but hopefully this basic example makes it clear that you can't swap those two things in general. Okay, so now uh, continuing on with things that you may have already seen before, if I have a ring R, then a left R module is an algebra with universe M and addition, negation, a zero, and this sequence of operations, lambda R, one for each little r in my ring R, so that M with addition, negation, and zero is an abelian group, uh, where for each little r in R, we have that uh, lambda, little r, is a unary operation. And then if I have any r and s in the universe of my ring, uh, we have that the laws lambda r x plus y is the same as lambda r x plus lambda r y. And then lambda r plus s x is the same as lambda r x plus lambda s x. And finally, uh, lambda r of lambda s of x it's the same as lambda r times s of x, where this is the product of r and s in the ring r. And similarly, this addition is the sum of r and s in the ring r. And so, uh, so these identities basically say that the, uh, these scalar multiplication operations induced by the elements of the ring actually are compatible with the structure of the abelian group which uh, corresponds to this module. Okay. So a few comments about modules. We actually didn't follow either of our existing rules uh, for specifying the sequence of basic operations uh, for an algebra in the preceding definition. It's a little tedious, but not difficult to carefully formalize what we just did. Um, so if you go back and look at uh, the previous talk, you'll see that we gave explicit rules. I think I even reviewed them early today, actually. And uh, we didn't follow either of those rules. But you should be able to see how this new scheme for defining an algebra actually fits into the old one we already had. So also notice that the similarity type of an R module depends on the ring R in contrast with the previous examples where all groups had the same signature, all semi-groups had the same signature. Um, so all modules do not have the same signature. And so uh, that's basically because we have as many of these uh, unary scalar multiplication operations as we have elements of our ring. And so the next comment here is that if our ring has an infinite universe, if its underlying set R is infinite, then an R module will always have infinitely many basic operations. And so, uh, although R modules are probably somewhat familiar to you at this point, uh, this is maybe the first sort of weird or slightly shocking example where you know of something which has infinitely many basic operations associated with it. Okay, so, and that's also allowed, of course, by the way. We didn't say anything about our sequence of basic operations having to be finite. Now let's look at an algebra which is uh, a little bit different from many of the ones introduced in introductory courses. A quasi-group is an algebra Q with three basic operations, 
of signature 222, so this is a set with three binary operations defined on it, which satisfies the laws listed here. And so we think of this dot operation as uh, the usual multiplication, and we think of, so I guess I'll say we think of this as the quasi-group uh, multiplication, and we think of these as two division operations, and we'll see why that is in a second. So when we have uh, something like this, where it's x backslash y, we think of that as being as being x under y as though it were a fraction, although strictly speaking, it's not. And similarly, we think of x forward slash y as being x over y. And so, uh, and so with that in mind, it makes a little more sense why we might have that x under x times y should be y because we're thinking of this like the fraction xy over x, where we could cancel the x's. So that's not, strictly speaking, what it is, but that's the way that we can think of it. Similarly, x times y over y would be something like xy over y, like this, and then we would cancel the y's and get x, which is why we have the identity xy over y is x. And similarly for the other two identities. So that's the definition of a quasi-group. Let's see some specific examples of quasi-groups. If we have a group G, then the algebra, uh, the algebra where we define x over y as x times y inverse in the group G, and x under y as being x inverse y in the group G, this is actually a quasi-group. So we can take any group G and turn it into a corresponding quasi-group, where the multiplication in the quasi-group, that first binary operation, is just the group multiplication in the group G. So just as we think of groups as being magmas with a particular special type of binary operation, from which we can obtain the unary and nullary operations of the group, so too can we think of quasi-groups as magmas with a particular type of binary operation from which we can obtain the other two. So the relevant uh, magma is a Latin square, which is a magma so that given any A and B in my universe, I can always find some X and Y so that A times X is B, and y times a is b. In other words, I can always solve these two equations and importantly, those solutions must be unique. So there can only be one and there must be at least one. So there has to be exactly one solution to each of these two equations. And so if I have a Latin square, a magma that has this unique solution of these types of equations for any a and b in my magma, then um, I can actually turn that Latin square into a quasi-group by taking the unique solution to this first type of equation to be my definition for what a under b is, and I can take the unique solution to the second type of equation as the definition for what b over a is. Um, for when I go to define the other two binary operations for my quasi-group. And so this is just like the situation with groups, where if you only give me the binary operation of the group, I can use that to figure out what the inverse operation must be, and I can also use that to figure out what the identity of the group is. So not all quasi-groups come from the previous construction using groups. If I consider the magma Z with subtraction as its basic operation, uh, this actually is a Latin square whose corresponding quasi-group doesn't arise from a group operation in this way. 
and that's just because subtraction is certainly not the binary operation of a group because it is not even associative. So uh, for a different example, let's denote by R the set of real numbers. If we fix some natural number n, then we can define x dot y to be the midpoint of the segment joining x and y for any x and y in Rn, the canonical n-dimensional real vector space. And so the algebra, which has its universe as R, Rn, and this dot operation, this midpoint operation as its uh, multiplication, this is a Latin square. And so, of course, has an associated quasi-group in the way that we just described. And again, since uh, this operation, this dot operation is not a group operation, it doesn't arise in the same way, um, or it doesn't arise uh, from this construction that we had before where we can turn any group into a quasi-group. So we can see from this that quasi-groups are more general than groups. There are more quasi-groups in a certain sense than there are groups. Uh, Quasi-group operations are typically not associative. We've already seen uh, examples of this. And uh, quasi-groups can be thought of as non-associative versions of groups. Uh, and so if we want something which even more closely uh, approximates what a group is without having uh, the associativity, we can also consider quasi-groups with identity, which are called loops. And um, even if you include having an identity element, there are still lots of loops which are not groups. Although, of course, all groups are loops. So uh, there is uh, quite a mature theory of loops in particular, and uh, that parallels but is distinct from group theory. All right, now uh, let's move on to looking at a uh, more associative sort of algebraic structure. A semi-lattice is a commutative semi-group. So S with some binary operation, which is commutative and associative, uh, which also satisfies the identity X times X is X. And so this is called, this is called idempotent. I, no. <laughs> idempotence. Okay, so in other words, a semi-lattice is an idempotent commutative semi-group. So for an example of this, if I take A and B to be two integers, then I can let the min of A and B and the max of A and B denote the minimum and maximum respectively of the set consisting of just A and B. So both the integers equipped with the binary operation minimum and the integers equipped with the binary operation maximum are semi-lattices. If I want another example, I can take A and B to be two natural numbers and then define GCD of A and B and LCM of A and B to be the greatest common divisor and least common multiple of the set AB respectively. So both mag the magmas n with greatest common divisor and the natural numbers with this binary least common multiple operation, both of these are actually semi-lattices. That is, they're, they're associative, uh, commutative, and idempotent. So uh, for even another example, if I take any set A, then I can take as my universe the power set or the collection of all subsets of A. And then if I take the binary operation intersection of two sets, then uh, this magma is also a semi-lattice, as is the collection of all subsets of A equipped with the binary union operation. So both of those magmas are actually commutative idempotent semi-groups. So now, as you might imagine, if there are semi-lattices, presumably those are half or semi of a lattice in some sense. And there are indeed algebras called lattices. Uh, 
which you also may have guessed from the title of this series of talks, which is Universal Algebra and Lattice Theory. So this next algebraic structure, which I'm going to introduce, actually has a lot of um, relevance to everything that we're going to do going forward. So a lattice is an algebra L with two basic operations. And so uh, these will be called meet and join. The two symbols are called wedge and V. And I did not turn the sound of my phone off, so I apologize for that. Um, so that if I take L and meet, I get uh, a semi-lattice and L equipped with the join operation is also a semi-lattice. And I have the identities that X meet X join Y is X and X join X meet Y is also X. And so these are called the absorption laws because we can think of them as this X absorbing this X join Y and similarly this X absorbing this X meet Y here. Okay. So we'll hold off on giving a lot of the intuition behind lattices and their corresponding theory until uh, we actually discuss them specifically. But for now, let's just content ourselves to take a look at some examples. We actually have that if we take the integers where the meet operation is minimum and the join operation is maximum, then this algebra is a lattice. Similarly, if I take the naturals with the meet operation GCD and the join operation LCM, those, that algebra is also a lattice. And finally, if I take all subsets of any particular set A that I choose and use the operations uh, intersection and union for my meet and join, then this algebra is also a lattice. And so as we can see, many familiar objects in um, in algebra, or at least in arithmetic and set theory, uh, do seem to form lattices in a natural way. So in some of the earliest work, which laid the foundations for lattice theory, uh, this would have been um, around the year 1900, so about 120 years ago from the time when I'm speaking. Uh, Dedekind considered the lattice of subgroups of an abelian group A. So he fixed a particular abelian group A and said, let's consider the collection of all of its subgroups where the operations are intersection of two subgroups, which gives another subgroup, and internal direct sum of two subgroups, which also gives another subgroup. And so this structure actually is a lattice and that was uh, some of the initial work that was done on lattice theory was on those particular sorts of lattices. Okay, so now you might be wondering, since I have gone on so much before about uh, being able to deal with these crazy, you know, 125 very operations, you know, that combine things, so many different things all at once, and that universal algebra can deal with that. But uh, we haven't really seen any such operations, right? Weren't we going to see algebras with all sorts of crazy entry operations for n strictly greater than two? Where are those crazy ternary, five ary, 127 billionary operations? Um, so historically, people seem to more frequently produce and study binary operations or constant or unary operations. Arity three and higher seems to be pretty alien by some ways of thinking. Uh, so it takes a little bit more work to produce a very easy natural example of such an operation. Uh, there are of course unnatural examples as well, but I can't imagine who would be interested in, in such a thing. Um, so in any case, uh, an algebra uh, with a single n-ary operation is called an n-ary magma. So this is just like a magma, but when I just say magma by itself, 
I usually am going to mean an algebra with just a single binary operation, but there's also an n-ary version of that where I have a set equipped with a single n-ary operation. And so to give an example of this, if I fix some natural number n, then I can take n minus 1 vectors, x1 up through xn minus 1, in the n-dimensional vector space over R, and I can define f of x1, x2, up through xn minus 1 to be the determinant of this matrix, whose rows are x1, x2, blah, 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 up through xn minus 1, and except for the final row, whose entries are the standard basis vectors. And so if you've seen the definition of the cross product in R3, where I take the cross product of two vectors, this is the same exact definition, except now I'm taking the determinant of an n by n matrix instead of a three by three matrix. So this operation is called the n-dimensional cross product. And if I take the set Rn as my universe, and I equip it with this n-ary operation, then this is an n-ary magma. And so here's a fairly geometric example of an n-ary magma. Now, of course, people tend to favor the uh, three and eight dimensional versions of this, I believe. Uh, there's something nice having to do with which real division algebras exist that I won't get into here, but some of these cross products are privileged over other ones. In any case, they all exist, and each one gives us a corresponding n-ary magma for that value of n. Oh, it was seven dimensions. OK, I won't, I won't dwell on it. There's, there's some other cross product that's even better than the other ones. <laughs> OK, so in algebra, um, oh, I already said this, yes. Yeah, so, um, there are also n-ary analogs of groups and quasi-groups, uh, which have received quite a bit of study. But I won't get into those today because I have uh, definitely <laughs> kept you for long enough. And so um, I will thank you very much for having uh, checked out all of these examples of, um, of algebras as uh, they are considered in universal algebra. And I look forward to seeing you here or wherever you are or somewhere next time. Thank you.